afternoon's um, webinar. You might have just heard that we're recording in progress. It's just to remind you that the, uh, uh, the webinar will be recorded and it can be shared afterwards via the NIA website. And the slide deck will also be on the NIA website in the members section if you want to refer back to that. Or if there are others who haven't been able to join who, who you think might have, found, might have found it useful and interesting, they'll be able to uh, be able to do that. Can I ask a couple of housekeeping things? If people who are on who haven't yet done, if you could put yourselves on mute, it just helps to avoid too much background noise and make sure that people can hear the um, hear the presentation and the and the main discussion. And if I could also remind you, if you have any questions, that's right, um, or points you want to raise, we've got some time towards the end. Yeah. All right, so uh, to be able to do we're that. We're gonna have to uh, take it offline here. Um, and if you have got questions, you can use the chat box at the bottom. Hopefully people are familiar with Zoom and Teams, et cetera, now that there's a chat function. Uh, if you can type your questions in there and we'll try to get through as many as we can uh, during the time we've got. And if we haven't got any, uh, we haven't got enough time, we'll try to get answers to the questions that we don't manage to, uh, to get to, to ask during the course of uh, the next hour or so, or towards the end of the next hour or so. So just to introduce uh, this morning, um, with uh, Moltex, uh, behind the scenes of Moltex, just my, many of you I'm sure are familiar with this, but I'll, I'll just, for anybody who isn't, um, Moltex, Moltex Flex, as we're uh, now known, was launched in the UK last October to develop the Flex reactor, a uh, small water reactor that employs molten salt as a fuel and coolant. Um, and alongside uh, Moltex's thermal energy storage system called Grid Reserve, the Flex reactor. Uh, is designed to be able to rapidly respond to changes in demand and provide reliable grid scale backup um, to uh, variable output renewables, including wind and solar. Uh, plans to build the first of a kind reactor by 2029 and roll out production worldwide throughout the 2030s. Moltex Flex believes this innovative British technology is a potential game changer that will help to bring low cost carbon free electrical and thermal energy to the world. Joining us from Moltex to lead us through the introduction to Moltex Flex and then take us uh, the, through the uh, the virtual lab tour and show us around and answer questions, uh, David Landon, CEO of Moltex Flex. And with David today is Rob Loveday, who is the communications lead for Moltex Flex. And I think we'll be joined by others of your colleagues uh, towards the end to help to fill the questions. So I'm going to hand over now uh, to David and Rob, who will introduce themselves and, and start the presentation. Wonderful. Well, thanks. Thanks ever so much for that uh, great introduction, Tom. Uh, thanks. Hello. Good afternoon to everyone. It's lovely to, to welcome you uh, here to Warrington. Uh, as you've heard from Tom, I'm Rob Loveday. I'm the communications officer for Multex Flex in the UK. I've been with the company now since uh, we launched uh, last October. And uh, this is David Landon, our, our CEO. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, can I just check? Is that showing on the, is the presentation showing? On I don't think we, I think we're still on a live view at the moment, but we'll, we'll Not yet. Do the, switch to the presentation in a moment. But uh, while we're doing so, probably a good idea, actually. Oh, yeah. um, you've, been, you've been with the company for uh, quite a bit longer than I have, haven't you, David? So it's probably a good idea. Some of you may have heard of uh, Moltex uh, in terms of what we've been doing elsewhere in terms of your energy, but of course, Moltex Flex is, is, uh, is quite a new uh, addition to the family. So, yeah, David, tell us a little bit about uh, who we are and how we fit into the, the, okay. the Maltex. Well, first of all, I, sh I should say thank you to the NIA for arranging this great opportunity to show people around and tell people a bit more about what we're up to. So thank you to the NIA. But also thank you to everybody who's joined it this afternoon. I think we were just talking, there's, there's nigh on 300 people have joined us. So it's great to have everybody on board and thank you very much for that. So yeah, yeah in answer to your question, Rob, I mean, I, I joined Moltex about three and a half years ago. Um, and, and that was when I met a guy called Ian Scott, who many people will have heard of, who is our sort of founder and chairman. And, and the Moltex journey started 10 years ago, really sort of 2012 time when we asked the question, um, how do we make nuclear energy low cost? How do we make it deployable globally? How do we do that in a time scale that can really help contribute to make a meaningful contribution to net zero? And the, the choice we made, having looked at the various technologies, was, was, was molten salt. And, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that as we, as we go through the presentation. Um, you, you asked me the question about the company. So yeah, Maltex Energy was formed in sort of 2012-ish. 
we we do have two subsidiary companies. Uh, we've got some our colleagues in Canada who are also developing molten salt technology. In that case, it's a technology for taking oxide fuels and recycling that and producing energy from from essentially from waste fuel, and that's really exciting. Um, you know, a real real exciting way to deal with our waste stocks. But the, the technology we're going to talk about today is a, a low enriched uranium version of a molten salt reactor, very specifically chosen as something that can be readily deployed um, globally. So that's what we're talking about. We'll go into a bit more detail and then very keen to get you into the lab and meet some of the team and see some of the work we're up to. Um, I should say, just I hope, hopefully you can see the screen now, um, but um, we're, we're based on Birchwood Park. I'm sure many of the people on the call know that and they'll probably recognise the pond. Uh, you know, probably may even be walking past it to go for lunch later, who knows? But, you know, we're, we're in Rutherford House and I, I thought it was worthwhile reflecting. It's actually just over 100 years since Ernest Rutherford did the first controlled fission reaction in the Cambridge labs. Um, you know, and, and here today we're talking about a very exciting way of, of fishing. Sorry. Indeed we are. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a shame he's not really here to, to, to see what, what we're doing. But uh, in terms of what we are doing, what is the flex? Why do we, why does Multics Flex exist? What's our, what's our mission as a company? What are we, what are we trying to achieve? So, whoops, let's uh, you go back one. What's the screen? Oh, right. Oh, that's, uh, I, I think that's the screen, that, that slide there. But, um, oops, we seem to have, oh, what's going on there? I'm sure. Apologies, everybody. Oops. I, I mean, I'm yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. Rob, can you just saw that? So, let's see if I can sort that out. That's, it should be, uh, in terms of multiple slides, as, as I say, this, this started 10 years ago, and the, you know, the whole ethos was very much about how do you provide low cost energy? How do you do that on a scale that is meaningful for, for, net, for net zero and, and on a time scale that's meaningful for net zero? So that, that's, that's what we're about. We, we, we chose the molten salt technology. Um, sorry, Kevin. We're having a bit of trouble with the slides. Um, is there a way we should And um, Rob, did you want me to share them? Yeah, if you can, please start. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that. probably... Yeah, otherwise we'll, be, there, we'll yeah. be focused on that rather than talking to people, which is not, not great. So apologies, yeah. apologies, everybody. But yeah, do yeah. do carry on. Let's yeah. uh, uh, let's see what uh, see what we've got to. So yeah, we're we're talking about um, the the flex reactor. That's that's the main mission of of Multex Flex. Yeah. So so um, I mean, just to give everybody a, an idea of the technology. So I'll, I'll go a bit more into the molten salt technology. But on the on the screen now, you can see. A depiction of what is a, a 1500 megawatt peaking plant so on the on the right of the screen you have a number of flex reactors so that's an array of 32 reactors each reactor is 40 megawatts thermal 16 megawatts electrical um, they they are one of the key features of the reactor is essentially it's load following so if 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 the balance of plant demands heat it will provide heat if it stops demanding heat, the reactor will wait until the heat is demanded again. So there's inherent flexibility in the reactor. But then on, on the, the left of the screen, you see the, the blue the blue tanks, which are what we term grid reserve, which is molten salt storage. So this, this provides a second degree of flexibility. So the energy from the reactor can be stored in molten salt very, at very low cost. And then that energy can be dispatched when needed. And, and so what we're showing is, um, basically 32 reactors producing 500 megawatts electrical electricity but peaking at 1500 megawatts for eight hours of the day and I, th I think we probably all recognize that you know one of the challenges we face is whilst we might smooth demand out on the grid you know the the, the inherent intermittency of some renewables the fact that you know we don't amount uh, demand the same amount of energy all day that that flexibility is going to be increasingly important um, I mean, one, one of the things, you know, we, we look at the UK and the published figures say we, we need a, a hundred gigawatts of flexible energy in the UK. You look worldwide, it's something like 4,000 gigawatts of flexible energy, energy. And typically that's being provided by gas in many cases at the moment. So this is very much about offering solutions that allow us to reduce our reliance and move away from fossil fuels while still enjoying, you know, the, the abundant energy, the flexibility of energy we, we have all come to know and, and, uh, and use. Fantastic. And so there are quite a few companies out there uh, developing small modular reactors and, uh, and one or two others that are also um, uh, developing 
molten salt. So, so why is molten salt advantageous? Um, yeah, uh, as a fuel. Okay, so could you go the next, next slide, slide on, please? Excellent. Yeah. So, I mean, molten salt is is not is not new, and and we're we're not the only company looking at molten salt. Um, the you know the idea of molten salt reactors was was thought about or started to be developed in the fifties, um, and you know, it was always seen as a high potential technology. And you know, indeed, the, the Americans at the time were looking at it for using it for flight, and and. Simply put, they wanted a, a, a nuclear technology, but equally well, we, we all know that we might not want them to, but planes crash, so we want something that doesn't, you know, in the worst case, doesn't cause a continental disaster. And, and that was one of the, you know, the beauties of molten salts. Um, and, you know, and you might say even, you know, the question we often get asked is, well, if they're so good, why don't we see commercial reactors out there? There's the MSRE, which was a, largely a test reactor, but they aren't commercial reactors. And, and, the, and the, big, the big challenge has been, has been corrosion. I mean, what, we, what, you, what you have is a high temperature cocktail of, you know, as fishing goes on, most of the elements of, in the, or many of the elements in the periodic table. And that, that is a very difficult corrosion problem. And in, in, a, in often what is in a conventional reactor, we, we have the, the, both the fission salt and the cooling salt are one salt, it's a single salt. That, that the, the reaction takes place in the reaction chamber, as you see on the left of the screen, that then moves through, it's pumped through into a heat exchanger, heat is taken out, and the cycle repeats itself. Um, and, you know, different, different people are doing different things to try and control that. And, and um, for example, you know, looking at things like high, high purity salts to take the corrosive, you know, to reduce the corrosion. But we, we've, we've approached it in a slightly different way. And, you know, the, the idea in the, the Moltex reactor is you have something which actually looks a bit more like a conventional reactor, as many of us know it. So you, you have a molten salt, which is, a, uh, which is containing the fissionable material. That's in a pin or a number of pins. And then that sits in a second molten salt, which is the cooling salt, which circulates around the outside of the pins and takes the heat away. And then that is used for beneficial use. And that, that solves a number of problems. I mean, we, you know, we sometimes say, you know, a problem shared is a problem hard. And I think that's very much the case with this technology. By doing that, the, the, the corrosion challenge is made much more simple. The, the, the other key feature of the, the reactor is we, 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 we use good quality salts, but we're not, we're not looking for ultra pure salts. What we use is some, some simple but clever chemistry to control corrosion. And we, we're going to take you in the lab and, and show you that in practice shortly. But, but essentially, by, by using metals which preferentially take out oxidizing agents, we, we, we protect the core reactor materials and, and prevent corrosion. Um, and then there are, there are other, you know, more subtle benefits. I mean, one of, one of the things is, you know, accountancy. We all, you know, those of us in the nuclear industry will know accountancy is a problem. We need to know where the atoms are. And, and you know, one of the beauties of, a, of this design is that with the fuel salt being in a pin, Yes, we know exactly where the atoms are, and therefore accountancy is really just using existing conventions. So there are there are many there are many benefits from 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 this this concept. Indeed, I think one of the major benefits is it, it makes it a really really simple design. And if we go to the next slide, we can see just how simple the design is. Um, I think one of the, uh, the the simplicity of it, I think, is one of the things that uh, when I first started learning about it, I, I just really thought, oh gosh, this is amazing. It was a really nice uh, example in a way of how uh, sometimes you know conventional wisdom you know becomes accepted in that in many other molten salt designs, people sort of think, well, because the original prototypes in the 60s mixed the fuel and the coolant, people then thought, well, that's how you make a salt molten salt reactor. But then um, you know, if, uh, uh, really uncovered, I think, back in the day, they thought about putting things back in tubes and Z and the thought, well, let's look at this a bit further. But um, you can really see from the schematic, I think, how, how simple the design is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we've, as well as recognising the benefits of multi we, we you know, with all the thinking has been, how do we, how do we keep that simple? How do we keep it low cost? And, and what we're doing is using, in many cases, avoiding the need for active systems and using passive systems and, and physics 
to 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 do things with the reactor. So, for example, we use in natural convection to move the cool to move the cooling salt around and take heat away. So we don't rely on pumps. Um, we, we for reactivity control, we have a thing called a gadolinium thermometer, which is a bit like a conventional mercury thermometer, but essentially it contains a neutron poison in a bulb. And if you heat the bulb, uh, or as the reactor gets hotter, that drives um, neutron poison into the core, um, controlling reactivity. And, and as, as as you cool that, the, the neutron poison is taken out of the uh, the core, increasing reactivity. And 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 simple things like that are, are allow us to avoid active devices, mechanical parts, and 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 use good you know physics to do that and keep keep it very simple. Indeed, it all relies on the on the laws of physics. It all runs by convection. There's hardly any pumps or any moving parts. It's all about keeping things simple, keeping it low cost, and uh, and uh, and easy to build. So if we go to the next slide, we can actually see what uh, the inside of the reactor might look like. And slightly more. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I've, I've talked a bit about the the theory, but um, here you see a, a cutaway of the reactor. So what what we're talking about is the. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Debit. Sorry. Debit. Debit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry, we, we've got a pit reactor. So we're talking something which is, you know, to give you a size is, is it, you know, the overall is about maybe the size of a moderate size house, but the pit itself is seven meters deep, uh, six meters diameter. Within that, you've got a, a tank filled with the graphite, with the cooling salt, with the, the, the fuel pins, and then heat exchangers um, external to, to the reactor. But some of the I'd say it's about the size of a, multi, uh, of a, a small, medium-sized house. Um, it's a thermal reaction reactor, so we're using graphite to do that. Um, probably a key point to note is that, again, we, we are heavily cost-driven, so we're using commercial-grade graphite, which we'll say a bit more about and show you a bit later, as opposed to you know, nuclear graphite. But it, um, one of the key design philosophies is to be used currently available materials. I mean, our, our aim is to deliver this reactor, as Tom said, by the end of the decade and then roll out in the 30s. Um, so to do that, it's our belief we've got to use materials that are available now. So very much the design is based on, for example, steels and alloys that are currently available um, so that we can achieve that. Um, the, the, the salts in the reactor, the fluoride salts, um, you know, both the cooling salt and the fission salt. I, I've, I've said it already. I mean, one of the things we, one of the strategies we've adopted to make it globally deployable is to go for low enriched uranium. So we believe um, sending that technology around the world will be, will, will be much easier um, with, a, with a low enriched uranium solution. So we've gone for, you know, low enriched uranium to do that. Um, and, and then another, another key feature, again, using um, natural convection rather than a pumped uh, small reactor. modular reactor. Sorry, we've, we've got. <laughs> um, we've, we've got um, for heat, emergency heat removal. Again, we use a duct, a duct system and use a natural, you know, natural convection to circulate air around the outside of the reactor. Therefore, we don't need backup generators and cooling systems to ensure the reactor's cooled. Indeed. And so again, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so obviously there are, um, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, materials and in terms of uh, uh, the design, it's uh, designed to be low cost. What other, what other factors uh, help in that process? Well, first of all, the reactor is not pressurized. So we're, we're, we're essentially working at atmospheric pressure. So we, we still have to contain nuclear material. I mean, that's a you know, basic IAEA requirement, and, you know, rightly so. But, but because we're at low pressure, um, there's a lot less steel and concrete required for containment. That's the first point. Secondly, we, we don't have moving parts. Um, the, so therefore, we, we, it eases both the backup systems needed, but also the maintenance needed. I mean, we... we, we, we the number of systems um, on this is, is is probably about a tenth of the number of systems you get on a, a more conventional reactor. So it is much simpler. There's there's a lot less about drives cost. Um, the I mean other other factors. High temperature is is important um, in a, in a number of ways. I mean first of all because we are at an output of 750, 
we, that opens up the possibility of storing energy in, in grid reserve. And I know we say that in a bit, in, or in molten salt as grid reserve. So that, that opens up possibilities as well. We, that opens up low cost storage. And, and, a, and another factor, particularly when we think about electricity generation, is we're, we're getting high, high quality heat. So not only are we reducing costs in the reactor island, but we're also reducing costs in the balance of plants because, because we have high quality heat, more efficient, we have smaller turbines, they're standard off the shelf products from, from the likes of Siemens, GE, um, you name it. Um, but that, you know, so it's, it's both a reactor island, but also the balance of plant where we're taking cost out. Indeed. So if we look at the uh, next slide, we can see uh, we can talk a little bit about grid reserve. And I think that's one of the that's one of the things that really excites me about uh, uh, Multex and Multex Flex as well, because there's there's a lot of people, uh, as I mentioned, developing small modular reactors. There's very, very few that are simultaneously as we are developing an energy thermal energy storage system. So let's talk a little bit about grid reserve and how that works. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in fairness, Rob, we're not the, the only ones looking at this. But, oh, no. but I think I, I think the key point is these advanced nuclear technologies, such as flex, operating at higher temperatures, open up that possibility. And, you know, on all the analysis we've done, molten salt storage is, is a very cost effective way of storing energy. And it gives it, it gives added flexibility to nuclear. And, that, and that, that's the benefit of it. And. Uh, that, that's, that, I think that's a key point to make there. But Absolutely. you know, this is this is why we believe these advanced nuclear technologies. And you know, I work for Maltex because I believe in this technology. But I think this is why we believe these advanced nuclear technologies are so important because of that, that high temperature output. Absolutely. I mean, it is a really uh, uh, key point of of, of what yeah. we're doing here is that we've got the grid reserve that can respond to curves in demand, it can act peaking and it can compete with gas, it can complement renewables. And again, if we go to the next slide, there is um, that is part of the flexibility that we offer. But again, that that heat component is a clear and a vital component because we again in, in terms of nuclear, we traditionally think of electricity, don't we? But in yeah. terms of the overall deep decarbonization that we need if we're going to hit net zero um, and do it to meaningfully fight climate change. Using heat per industry in, in so many yeah. different applications is massively important, isn't it? It, it, it is, and I'm, you know, I'm sure, you know, we've got many people on here who are, are very educated in energy. And, you know, I, I always quote the figure that at the moment we get about 20%, 20% of our energy comes through the grid. So even if we decarbonize tomorrow, we've only solved one fifth of the problem. And I, I'm sure everybody on the call understands that. So, you know, High temperature heat as a means of the deep decarbonisation is absolutely essential. You know that's, that is a real challenge. Um, I, I think the slide that we've, we've got up there just shows some of the flexibility that goes with this technology because we've we've got a, a small modular reactor at forty megawatts, sixteen electrical nominally, sixteen megawatts electrical. That could be a singular unit. It could be an array of half a dozen, or it can be. In, in sort of grid applications, it might be an array of 32 equivalent to about 500 megawatts. So there's a lot of flexibility in, in the, 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 the basic reactor. If we, if we then look at heat, with heat at 750, that is a really useful heat for many industries. So many useful industries can make use of that heat um, in all sorts of areas from for industrial processes, for desalination, for all sorts of applications there. But equally well, it's a great base heat, even for some of the industrial processes that need higher temperature. You know, you get 750 degrees and then you can top that up. So when you go into steel making, glass making, where you need higher temperatures, you've got a great base heat as a starting point. So in either case, that works. And, and then and then you go into electricity generation. You know, you know we, we can operate as base load as conventional nuclear tends to. Um, you know, and we, we've got some very exciting numbers there. We're looking at something that's sort of 28 pounds per megawatt hour, which and I'm sure again everybody will recognize is a, a really exciting number. But but we, we can also look at you know seasonal energy. I mean, whether it's you know, you know I, I, I spent a fair bit of time in the Middle East recently. Um, you know, that you know, just as we turn off turn on our heating in winter, they turn off their air conditioning in winter. You know, so you know, how do you deal with that seasonal change? You know, again, you've got a technology here which can allow you to flex and deal with those seasonal changes. And, and then there's, you know, just the fact that we use different amounts of electricity during the day. You know, we use more in the evening when we all get from home from work. So to deal with peak demands, again, looking back to the, the first slide I presented, 
coupling that technology together with grid reserves allows you to have a peaking plant which can produce, which can allow us to manage those peaks in demand. So really exciting, very flexible, and and you know a huge potential. Indeed, it is. So okay then, uh, thanks for that. Let's get back to the live view now, and uh, I am all uh, I am. Uh, Certainly, we're all uh, uh, really now excited to see some of the work we're actually doing to, to make the flex, re re flex reactor a reality. So I am now going to uh, put on my hat as cameraman and uh, also put on my protective glasses because I'm going into the lab, which is very important. And let me just uh, very quickly transfer the audio and hopefully it won't be too much when I can. Here's now, and let's, let's take a trip to the lab. So yeah, we're going to take you to the to the lab now. Um, I'm going to show you some of the research and development work we've been doing. Introduce you to some of the team members and let them talk about their work. And well, let's let's go there. <laughs> So, welcome to the Marta Club. So, what, what, where I wanted to start was we, we often tell people, well, molten salt, it looks like water, it pours like water, it's just a lot hotter. And that's easy said, but let, let's, let's show you what it really looks like. So, I'm going to take you over to meet Dr. James Moffat, who's one of our scientists. James, James, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, David. So, I'm Dr. James Moffat. I'm a chemist based here at Maltex Flex with the materials and chemistry team. Uh, I principally work on corrosion as well as thermal physical property measurements here in the Maltex lab. So what I'm going to show you today is demonstrate a molten salt pour. It's why, what happens when it pours, uh, why we'd want to study this, and what happens when it freezes in its association with the additional safety features we get for the flex reactor. So when we consider salt, typically we think of table salt, this white crystalline solid at room temperature that we use for food or throw on some icy road to uh, thaw out driveways and things like that. But that's when we consider uh, high temperature materials, such as lava, for example, this is molten rock, or uh, ice when we melt it, it's just water. So when we heat things sufficiently high enough in temperature, they then become molten, and the exact same could be said for salts. So for the setup here, the demonstration, we have a furnace which contains a graphite crucible with our coolant salt chemistry. Uh, it's a fluoride-based salt. Uh, what I'm going to do is open up the furnace, uh, take out the graphite crucible, and pour the salt into the nickel trays that we have here. Uh, what I want the audience to note is what happens to the salt as we're pouring it, how it behaves, and what happens when it begins to cool down. So whenever we do hot work here at Multex, we need to ensure that safety is a priority here. So I'm going to don a lab coat, which I've got here. Also put on uh, safety boots prior to this. No sandals without socks or with socks for that matter. Uh, and some heat proof gloves uh, with the appropriate tool to handle the graphite crystal itself. So there we go. So of course, the furnace at this temperature, it's currently at 740 degrees Celsius. So very high temperature, about three or four times the typical temperature you find in your kitchen oven or so. Right. So here we okay. go. So it's very hot. We're going to let James just focus on this for a minute. Um, so you can see the graphite crucible is actually red hot. So that's how hot it is. And here we go with the pour. So as you can see, as we were pouring it out, it behaves very much like water. Uh, it flows around the uh, crevices and cracks of the uh, nickel tray and fills them up very quickly, as you would expect water. And if it wasn't for the intense heat, you'd suspect that it was water. But in fact, it is a molten salt. So as it's cooling down, you should be able to notice some changes to the salt. You can see on the edges, we can see that uh, it's starting to turn white rather than this translucent clear appearance and as it's cooling down uh, especially towards the more towards the center now 
uh, it's becoming more white. And these are actually crystals of salt forming um, during its solidification process. You can see crystals here as well as they form. Now, despite this uh, solidifying and forming uh, crystals in the solid, this is still at very high temperatures. If we use a digital thermometer here, it's telling us this is over 500 degrees Celsius. It maxes out at 500 degrees. You can see that color change uh, here as white crystals are starting to form within the bulk of the solid. And if you listen closely, you may be able to hear cracking and snapping of the salt as it's forming a solid due to contraction and expansion and so forth. So um, why is this significant? Why is this a significant um, feature of the salt? Well, despite it being 500 degrees and forming a solid, this is particularly useful from a safety point of view. So if we would have uh, an accident scenario, if there was a leak or something, um, the leak would effectively be plugged as it starts to solidify. It's encountered a, uh, a cold environment relative to its freezing point and basically blocks off any, um, any additional leaks. In addition to this, the salt is also uh, fluoride salts. They're insoluble in water. So uh, these, it's not going to be a necessary issue if it, to escape into the water table, for example, or uh, be a, a significant risk to ecological hazards, particularly with water. So that's a significant safety advantage when it comes to using chloride salts and molten salts in the flux reactor. Okay. Yeah. Jade, that's great. Just, can you put the digital gun back on there? I think, of course. Just to see what temperature we're still at as we, we're absolutely solid now. So, so still over 500 degrees. Excellent. Thank you very right. much for that. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully everybody's got a better idea of what molten salt looks like, and and, and it's you know it's inherent safety the fact that it will you know freeze. As, as James has said, we're we're talking about something which is a low pressure. Were it even to escape the reactor, as soon as it sees a cold surface, it's going to be very solid and it's not going far, and that is hugely important. What what we want to do now is 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 introduce you to some of the work we're doing to understand the the properties of the salt. We we do a lot of work in modelling, um, so we do thermal hydraulics modelling, physics modelling, all sorts of modelling work. And as as everybody knows, modelling is only as good as the input data you put in. So we do need to know things like the viscosity, the density of the salts at all temperatures with different impurities. So I'm going to take you over and introduce you to Beth, who's one of our chemists, and Beth's going to tell you about our our rheometer. Beth, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> Hi, I'm Beth Batley. Um, I'm a chemist here at Montex Flex and I work as part of the fuel team. Um, just a bit of background, I did an MCHEM at Lancaster, worked in manufacturing for 18 months and then I've been at Montex Flex for five months. Um, so I'm here today to tell you all about our reactor. Uh, so this piece of equipment can measure the viscosity and density of our molten salts up to a thousand degrees. Now, how does it do that? If you want to focus on the cup and the bob inside the cup box. So here we insert the salt into the cup, the bob lowers down and they're enclosed inside this clamshell furnace. As you can see here, this heats up the salt and once it's molten, the bob inserts and rotates. And the force that's exerted on the bob is what tells us the viscosity and density information. So if you think about it as telling us, are we stirring a cup of water or are we stirring a cup of treacle, say. So we're really proud of this piece of equipment. Um, it was a big achievement for Maltex Flex. Um, so, but don't get me wrong, it didn't come without its challenges. Um, so the first one being when we first set out to uh, seek this viscosity and density information, um, because there wasn't much available published in the literature. Um, we thought we would try and get this data externally, but we were told minimum a year to get the data back. So we wanted to move faster than that. We brought it in-house and managed to get the rheometer up and running within six months. And then the other challenge um, was actually getting it inside the glove box. Uh, so we wanted the rheometer to be under an inert atmosphere because oxygen reacts with our salts, which changes its viscosity and density. So we wanted it under an inert atmosphere, meaning we can choose which impurities we introduce and study how they affect it. So yeah, really proud. And we are now one of a small number of facilities in the world that can obtain this information, uh, which as David said, is really important as it feeds back into our models. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Beth. Thank you. Excellent. Right. Okay, so we're now gonna move over and just look at some of the corrosion work. Uh, as I've already explained, 
we're, we're using some clever but simple chemistry to control corrosion. And we come over here. Um, let me introduce Phil Quell. Phil's our, our lab manager and uh, lead chemist. So Phil's going to tell you a bit more about the corrosion work. Phil, over to you. Thank you, David. So as David said, my name's Phil. I'm a chartered chemist working here at Multex Energy. Sorry, Multex Flex. Um, I've had about a decade of experience now in the nuclear industry, uh, starting with a nuclear graduates program where I was sponsored by the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. From there, I went to Rolls-Royce, did a period of time with the submarines program with both their materials and chemistry and their innovation groups. So when I joined about two years ago, uh, two and a half maybe, um, the challenge for me was to take the simple impurity tolerant chemistry off the page and make it real. So people could look at it, get a feel for it, and we could optimize it ready for the reactor. So we, we, I think we've done that really well. So in the past two years now, we've managed to get um, samples cooked continuously for that whole period and for, for our coolant salt chemistry. And then we've got quite a lot of fuel salt chemistry on as well. So we've got a sample here for you to look at. Um, what we like to do is we take uh, small cylinders, um, which, which are made out of the materials that you would make the reactor tank from. And we make sure all the ingredients are in there. So we've got graphite, which is our moderator. We've got various steels that you might use for fuel clad, for example, and then we have our, our salt. As you see, nice bright white salt. So this is a very simple fluoride chemistry salt with um, what we'll call our secret source of base metal additives, which enable you to control corrosion without having to go to hyperpurity. Um, that's the sort of the inside section of a pin that's seen three months of service in the reactor. Sorry, in the, uh, sorry, in the ovens. <laughs> uh, and, and this is what they look like. So this is just, this is the sort of pin that we would produce uh, at this point, we've, we've made hundreds of these. We've inspected many, many, many of them. And these are the cool and salt ones. And we do uh, fuel salt samples, which are thinner and taller to represent more what the fuel pin would be doing. Um, so that's room temperature. Slightly more interestingly is what they look like when you, uh, when you heat them up. Um, so as David has no doubt already told you, we are operating in the sort of 800 degrees region uh, in the reactor. So what we need to do is make sure the materials and chemistry are robust to that behavior. So we've got the ovens here. Uh, we're showing you a nice shiny steel pin. Uh, let's look at a very hot pin. I like to do this because it gives people the opportunity to, to really see what we are trying to achieve here, what high temperature means for Moltex Flex and therefore all of the opportunities that come with it. So I'll invite Rob to get close, but not too close. <laughs> there we are. Very hot, very red. Yeah, this is the real opportunity when it comes to supporting many indus industrial applications, not just for the electricity side, but for the, the, yes, the high temperature applications. Um, so one of the quick things for that is obviously these pins are many, but they're all one temperature and they're not flowing and our reactor and our coolants in the reactor need to flow. So what we've done to, to learn and to make sure that it, it is robust to all of those conditions if you have a small rigs area here where we've been able to build sort of kilo scale and um, flowing corrosion rigs, but probably slightly more interestingly, um, we've been able to get to 20 kilo scale um, flow loop rigs. This is our, our biggest rig that we've got going to date. The, the purpose of this rig is it's obviously steel underneath this uh, a large amount of insulation to keep it hot when we make it hot. But the purpose of this rig is to make sure that we can validate our modeling. So what we do is we've got big heating element down one side and small heating elements on the other, generate a difference in temperature so we can get that natural convection that David's probably already told you about, that natural circulation. So we don't need to use pumps in the main body of the reactor, keeping it simple, keeping it easy. And um, this thing's been up and down in temperature multiple times now. And um, so we were able to also demonstrate the other thing that got thrown at the sort of experimental community for molten, uh, for molten salts is about leakage. We can control this. There's lots of penetrations in it and it doesn't leak. And we're very proud of that. Is that any, any question? Excellent. No, brilliant. brilliant. Thank you, Bill. Cheers. So we've, we've showed you a bit about how we um, create test samples, demonstrate corrosion. Um, you know, Phil, Phil showed you, um, you know, through the eye what it looks like. Of course, we, we need to look deeper than that. So I'm going to introduce you now to Dr. Kira Fox, who's our senior metallurgist, and, and she's going to take you through some of our, our deeper sort of inspection techniques to really make sure we understand what level of corrosion is going on and we have cracked crack that corrosion problem. So over to Kira. 
Thank you, David. So as David said, I'm Dr. Kira Fox, Senior Metallurgist here at Moltex, and I've been here for about a year and a half. Before coming to Moltex, I did a PhD in a postdoc research position at Manchester University. And what I looked at was modifying stainless steels for light water nuclear reactors and focused on the corrosion layers. So I've got about seven years experience now looking at corrosion for nuclear reactors. So as Phil showed you already, we have our pins that come out of the oven. They've been exposed for six months, a year, maybe multiple years, depending on when we are, got them together. When we take them out, we cross-section them and we look at what do all the components do when they're in our salts. Okay, Julia, bye-bye. Have a good weekend. 800 degrees. Thanks. So I've bye -bye. got an example here of two different cells that have been on for multiple months. One that's got an optimized chemistry and one with a non-optimized chemistry. So straight away, we can see the salt visually to eye is white in the optimized chemistry. And that's exactly what it looks like when James just poured it fresh for you a moment ago. In contrast, our other pin with non-optimized chemistry has a blue tinge to the salt. And this represents that we've got corrosion going on and that the corrosion products are in our salt. So it's a really easy way straight away to say if we've got good chemistry, or if we've got chemistry that needs more improvement. What we've also got in these pins is we've got graphite blocks, which are the small black blocks at the edge, bottom, sorry. And we can see these have straight edges, all the cuts are still straight lines, and they haven't degraded in the salt. So we've got confidence in their properties. In addition to the salt and the graphite, we have a various range of steels that we look at in the reactor. And what we can see when they come out, again, visually to eye, is they're silver, shiny, there's no discoloration, there's no visible cracks so that we can see by eye. Or we've got an optical microscope, we can look at about 100 times magnification and we still can't see any cracking occurring. This is all well and good, but visually to the eye, we can only see so much, we can only learn so much. This looks like a stable system, but actually to see what changes are occurring, we need to go a little bit deeper. So as I said, this microscope here, the optical one, can go to about 100 times magnification. Here we have a scanning electron microscope, and this can actually go to 50,000 times magnification. This lets us look at the depths of about, say, one percent of a human hair. So they're very, very small areas that we're looking at to see what changes are actually occurring. So we can look at the stainless steel. So we've got a sample in now that is just one of these cross sections I showed you a moment ago. And we can look at the steel surfaces. What we visibly can see at um, one and a half thousand times magnification is a little bit of roughening, but it's on a very small scale. And the stainless steels look very similar under the microscope as they went in originally in the pins. What we can also see rather than just looking at the surfaces that look larger the same is we can look at a cross section of the materials. So we can see, do we have changes that go into the depth of the steel? And we can quantify these. But what we've got on this right hand screen is we have some small black spaces at the surface of the stainless steel on the electron image on the left. And what this is showing is material movement in the top 10, maybe 20 microns. This is to say maybe 10% of a human hair or a little bit more around that area. So it's very, very small amounts of corrosion. And in the colorful images, we've got iron, chrome, and nickel. And what you can see is they look stable across the entire surface of the image. And so what we're seeing is you're not having a lot of specific elements moving. So we can say that we've got a stable chemistry in the steel. And knowing that we've got stable chemistry there, that means we can guarantee that the steels will still function over time. At the end of life, they'll structurally be safe when they come out of the reactor after our six year life of the um, materials. So we can guarantee that we understand the chemistry, we understand the materials, and that everything's working well in harmony. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Kira. All right. All right. Well, should we move out the lab? Oh, I yeah. think so. Yeah. yeah. It's not just about the lab, is it? No. So obviously in the lab we get lots of lots of data. But, but as I've already said, a lot of our work also um, takes place in, in modeling space. You know, we, we use high performance computers to model physics, thermal hydraulics, you know, mechanical stress, all those sorts of things. So um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of insight into some of that work as well. So I'm going to just take you in here and introduce you to Luke Godfrey. So Luke Godfrey is the, the lead thermal hydraulics engineer here, and Luke will introduce himself and just say a bit about some examples of some of the work that's going on in the design and development of the reactor. Luke. Yep, so my name is Luke Godfrey. I'm the lead thermal hydraulic engineer at Maltex. I've been here about three years now. Um, previous to this, I was working in Dyson on the electric vehicle project, um, where I was working on cabin thermal management. Um, so similar things that's going on here, lots of uh, heat and flows. So one of the unique features of the Maltex reactor is that we have static molten salt fuel pins held within pins. 
um, and then that's surrounded by a separate non-fissile coolant salt. So obviously we have um, our molten salt within a pin which is being heated volumetrically by fission and then that heat must leave the pin at the pin wall where it's taken away by the coolant to go into useful things. So you can see here one of the um, various simulations that we've got of that natural convection process um, and you can see the, the fuel um, circulating on its own essentially uh, as it's heated and cooled um, and with the heat leaving the pin. Uh, we've got an experimental program in the lab, as you may have seen, um, where we're validating those um, experiments. Now, we want to deploy our reactor on a large scale um, all over the world, which means we need to design it for lots of varying conditions. Uh, so in this simulation, you can see a seismic simulation where a worst case earthquake is being simulated. Uh, and the frequency of the earthquake has been set to match the slosh frequency of the natural of the um, of the coolant at the top of the core. So as you can see, that produces quite a vigorous um, sloshing of coolant at the top of the core. Uh, and there's two things that we've learned from this simulation. The first of all, um, not too unexpected we need to put baffles at the top of the core to stop that sloshing because there's equipment up there that we don't want um, the coolant breaking. Um, but also that the forces on the tank and the core, uh, which I'll show you now, um, are nothing to worry about. Uh, essentially, we can tolerate the movement of the coolant although we are still going to put baffles in because of that aforementioned delicate equipment. So you can see here the, the forces aren't extreme. Another unique feature of our reactor is how closely coupled the thermal hydraulics and the physics are. So the interaction between these two areas um, gives us a lot of safety in that the hotter the reactor is, the less reactive it is. Uh, but it also leads to um, more complex analysis. So we've got here a in-house coupled code where the effects of the physics and the thermal hydraulics are feeding into each other um, to investigate various uh, transients of interest um, to make sure that they are acceptable. And this is an example of one such um, simulation. Excellent. Thank you, Luke. So as I say, we can't go through all the models, but hopefully it's given you a flavour of some of the work we're up to. So. That's the end of the tour. What we're going to do now is go back to the conference room and, and take any questions there may be. So hopefully that was interesting. Yeah. Great, thank you. <laughs> Dave and your colleagues, just while you're walking back to the room, um, there are a lot of questions. Yeah, um, many more than we're going to be able to deal with in there. Yeah. Yeah, lots of soap we've got left. So what I will do, what we'll do is um, questions that we don't get to answer, ask now, um, we've got a record of them all and um, we will get answers to those and alongside the, um, the recording of the webinar um, and the slides, we'll have answer, a document with answers to the questions that we don't get through in the next 10 minutes um, on, that, on that part of the website as well. So, um, so don't worry if I don't get to get to your question because there are there are quite a uh, it's quite a sizable number, which demonstrates to me, suggests to me that a, a lot of a lot of interest in what we've just seen and heard. So that's that's good. Um, I'm going to try to pick two or three that seem to points that come up a couple of times, or that um, David and, and colleagues, or that um, and, and that are slightly different um, from each other. Um, there's quite a few uh, people asking about combination of what level of support have you had from government, what interest have you had from government ministers, how are you funded, have you got any support from, um, from government in terms of funding, those types of questions. David, could I just could you just start with anything you want to say on that sort of broad point? Yeah, on the, on the broad point, we've, we've had, I think, good support. I mean, you know, many of you have probably seen, we, you know, most recently, we, we were really pleased. I, I was in Holland one night, I got a phone call, can, can ground chaps come and see what you're doing in the lab? So, you know, you saw James earlier pouring salt. Well, ground chaps did it not so long ago. He was there and, you know, good for him. He was up for that. So we've had good support with that. We're, we're obviously very much engaged with the, the, the current um, SMR engagement process and that's on, ongoing at the moment. But, it, but equally well overseas, I, mean, I mentioned earlier I've been to the UA, we, we won the um, Green Builders of Tomorrow competition and were hosted out to the UAE to go and visit, meet and visit investors. So, 
you'd always like more, of course you would. But you know, I think there's a there's a good level of interest, and I'm I'm quite excited by you know with with GBN, Desnes, and other things, and the way things are going. I'm quite excited by the prospect. Um, I, I just think collectively, our message to everybody was we we just need to move faster. And be, you know, if, if I was have my moment, I think there's a huge opportunity in the UK is with these technologies, but we've got to seize the moment with them. You know, if we hang around too long, then we're, we're going to lose and others will, will pick it up. So that's my my view on it. OK, thank you. I'm gonna, there's a couple of questions that I'll, I'll struck. I'm not going to say technical, but sort of more slightly more detailed questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a couple of those and David, you direct to who is the right yeah. person to be able to, to, to answer them. And um, one, there's a couple of questions along similar lines, but I'm just seeing Clive, Clive Ellsworth's question, which is asking why the original chloride fuel sort has been changed to fluoride. And can you explain the reason for that change? Do you want to say that one? Yeah, yeah. so um, just for context, so Maltex Flex is a UK company, and we have a sister company in Canada, um, Maltex Energy Canada. Uh, so we have two reactors between the two companies in Canada. They're developing a Montsalt waste burner, which is fast spectrum and uses a chloride fueling coolant. And here in the UK, we're developing a thermal spectrum conventionally fueled with um, enriched fuel um, reactor, which is fluoride fueling coolant. Um, so there's, there's two different reactors uh, with two different uh, use cases. Okay, so it's not it's not a change as such. It's no, no, it's, it's a different people, different different airline. Okay, yeah. thank you, thanks for, for that, clarifying. Uh, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah. So while the chloride reactor is being mainly developed over in the Canada uh, Canada side of the company, we still do a lot of the experimental work. So you saw the fluoride salt being poured today, but we also do a lot of work with chloride salts across the lab. So we have the expertise here to work with all of them. So that work is still supported here in the UK. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'd be the final, just a final comment on that as well. The, the fluoride salt, cooling salt, is a patented salt. It's actually used in the aluminium industry, but we have a patent for use in the nuclear industry. And it has amazing thermal properties. That's the reason we built for that. Um, and it happens to work in the flex reactor. You know, it, you know, it doesn't work as well. There's a much, much more technical discussion why that's not the right answer for the, the waste burner reactor. But for the flex reactor, it's a great choice. And, and that's why we built for it. Okay, um, thank you. There's a question from Charles Clark, which I've just noticed is sent to me rather than to everybody, so others might not see <laughs> looking in the in the in the chat, but basically asking how would you start the system from cold brackets frozen sort in the heat exchange components question mark. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Luke do that. You'll do it better than me. Yeah, so um essentially the once the reactor is commissioned, um, it effectively never goes cold again. So it maintains itself in a hot state until when it's decommissioned. Um, we're still working out the exact sequence of events for commissioning and startup, how to get it hot to start with, to put the salt in and to put the fuel in. Um, but there will be auxiliary heating essentially to get everything hot to start up. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, question, I have a couple more questions that are on, that are on fuel but there's um one from can candida whitmill um whether you've identified a source for your fuel or do you plan to manufacture it yourself um i'll answer that i mean the we, we're talking to the you know the us6 providers and the fuel manufacturers i probably i won't say any more than that there i mean the we, we've made we've made the fuel salt in the lab and we've done corrosion experiments with it um we're, we're now looking at how do we sort of commercialize that and and you know those, those are really ongoing discussions i'll probably on this i'm afraid i can't say a lot more than that but you know we we know how to make it we know we just need to get up to commercial production but certainly we'd be looking for a, a fuel manufacturer to produce the fuel for the reactor and, you know we have lots of discussions about things like fuel tubes and uh, various other parts of that so all the parts are there we, we just need to build that into a uh, a fuel manufacturer to pull it together for us. Okay. Um, question from Andy. I think it's Andy Kiang. Kiang, I'm not sure whether I pronounced your name, surname correctly, Andy. Sorry, apologies if I've mangled it. Um, if the reactor stays hot throughout the plant lifetime, how do you address maintenance challenges? Yeah, so um, essentially all the components that are in the reactor are designed for the life of the reactor, um, and we need to ensure that we build in the margin so that they are operational for the life of the reactor without um, maintenance. 
essentially. Um, components that are removed and replaced in the reactor don't have to be designed for the entire plant life, just as long as they are in the reactor. Right, okay. Um, and uh, so I just, I saw one, I was trying to find it again now. Um, oh yeah, it's a question that I think was directed to, towards you, Kira, from, from, from Pat, Pat Garth, asking about a grade of stainless steel. Um, have you used, um, which I think was from something you showed us in the, in the lab, no, you made the can I just quickly, I think somehow the, uh, the, the, the camera is off. People can't see us. Is that... There are two feeds, I think. Yeah. One's a camera and one's audio. Okay. So right. we've just got the right one selected. People can see us. Oh, good, 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 good. Right, sorry, panic over. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so grades of stainless steels. So we haven't done a final selection on what steels we use in what parts of the plant. So obviously we've got tank materials, we've got heat exchangers, we've got fuel tubes. And we'll optimise each area to make sure we pick the correct grade. All the grades we're looking at are off the shelf, available and affordable materials. We haven't done final selections, but grades like 316 are things that we are considering. Um, even at our high temperatures, we're at very low pressures. So very common kitchen grade stainless steels are appropriate for our use. They've got the correct physical properties. We're working on them to understand how to behave the molten salts. And many of these have had a radiation experience. So we're able to look at quite a wide range of different options. So we're still working on an exact selection process, but. I think it's fair to say we're down to a short list. A, yes. A, a very short, short list. Yes, no, we're already looking at a few different um, options for components, but we're quite lucky in the space we're working, we've actually got a lot of opportunity. So we can make sure we choose something that's going to let us hit affordable price points with the best performance. So. It's a similar story with our graphite moderator, isn't it? We're doing a lot of research, thanks to the Henry Royce Institute grant with the University of Manchester. We are, yes. So instead of using a traditional nuclear grade graphite, we're also looking, well, we're instead looking, sorry, I should say, at using, say, electro, electro materials, just other conventional industrial grade materials that are cheaper, um, easier to use. They've got less purity, but because our system is such a tolerant system, we don't need to ensure that. So we don't need the nuclear code stamps on it. We just need to make sure it's still of a high quality and it'll work with our salts. We've had a really great partnership looking with them to see how the salt and the graphite interact together. So it's going really well, and we're looking at a second package of work to continue later in the year. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm conscious we're, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to ask, um, get a last question for, for David for a make up a closing remarks, which is from Howard Thompson, um, which is a gives you a free hit at the end, David. Uh, <laughs> what, what more can the nuclear community do to inform experts about how molten salt reactors, including grid storage heat, are way better than most people talk about. Ooh. I, th I think I think you know it's events like this. We you know we we've you know one one of the things we were going to say at the close actually we've today's been great and again, once again thank you to the NIA for arranging that and thank you for everybody joining it. I think you know we we I, I suspect most of the people on this call know about this already. So I'm not I'm not giving something completely new, but I know as you go and talk to, more widely, people are less knowledgeable. So I think we've got a huge thing to do in sort of spreading the word a bit. I mean, we, we've got the, um, the the ANT event next next Wednesday. Um, so we'll, we'll be there, as, as will probably many people on the call. So we, we need to do more of that and, um, yeah, you know, spread spread the word about the technology and, and, and make, I think, make people aware of the facts. I mean, you know, I, you know, I, I used it at the start. I'm, I'm not the only one who uses it, but you know, just the sheer challenge we have on that zero. You know, twenty percent of energy comes through the grid. What about the other eighty percent? You know, we, we've got to find ways to to deal with that, and that is a massive challenge. It's, you know, it's that, that 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 that's the point, and we we just need to spread the word about it a lot more. We we're certainly trying to do our bit, as I'm sure everybody else is. Great, thank you. Um, we are just about out of time. Thank you. Dave for mentioning the uh, event in Manchester next week, uh, and or advanced nuclear technologies. Um, if people are interested in that and haven't registered and may be interested in uh, coming along, let us know and we can send you the details. Um, uh, there'll be a whole range of different uh, applications of advanced nuclear being discussed during the course of that, of that day next Wednesday at the Concord Centre near Manchester Airport, um, uh, including, including Multic Flex. Um, I'd like to thank, thank you, David, uh, and your colleagues uh, for the tour, for the presentation. As I said at the start, the um, recording of the webinar and the, uh, uh, and the slides will be on the website. We'll also 
add in answers to the questions that we didn't manage to get to uh, during the course of, uh, of the last few minutes. Um, and so hopefully that will give everybody uh, uh, all of the, uh, the summary of everything we've talked about today uh, for those who haven't been able to make it and if you want to go back and refer to it again. But thank you very much indeed, everybody, for joining today. And I hope to see some of you next week in Manchester. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Great presentation.